subject is uh, one of the most important ones that people ask a lot of questions about and it's also one of the most confusing ones dealing with the coming of a cosmic king and of course you know who that is talking about the return of the Lord sometimes referred to as the second coming of Jesus now why is this so important this is referred to as the second coming of Jesus because when Christ came the first time as a baby that was the first coming Jesus people the Jewish nation they had scriptures they had hundreds of prophecies that talked about Jesus coming and here's my question when Jesus came the first time were his people ready no in spite of all the prophecies they had you see there's some prophecies in the Bible that talked about when he comes the second time like a lion but he comes the first time like a lamb and they got them mixed up and so when Jesus came quietly as a baby the only ones who really were ready were some shepherds and some wise men from another country his own people were amazed when the wise men said where is he that is born king of the Jews they said what are you talking about and they had been reading the Jewish prophecies those wise men probably reading the prophecies of Balaam that you find in the book of Numbers so if God's people were not ready when he came the first time could history repeat itself how do we know that won't happen again well it's gonna happen again a lot of people won't be ready so we need to find out something more about how he is coming let's first establish some foundations and again we're gonna use our question answer format question number one can we be positive that Jesus will return to this earth again well he promised he'd come the first time in the Old Testament and even though it took four thousand years he did come then he said I will come again it's as clear as it can be you can read it there in John chapter 14 verse 3 and if I go and prepare a place for you I doesn't say I might I could I may he says I will come again now, I frankly believe what the Lord says again it says in Matthew 26 verse 64 Jesus said to the high priest when he was being tried nevertheless I say to you hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven the language in the Bible is unmistakable it's extremely explicit he said I will come again and he not only told us he's coming he told us something about how he's coming that's our next question in what manner will Jesus return the second time now we're gonna dedicate a lot to this question tonight because I not only want you to know that he is coming back and we'll give you more evidence tonight we'll tell you something about when no man knows the day or the hour but you can know when it's near but I especially want to focus on how is he coming because Satan is going to seek to impersonate Christ it will be the masterpiece of the last days so we need to know something about how he's coming if you look in the book of Acts chapter 1 it tells about when Jesus ascended to heaven after his first coming and it says in verse 9 while they the apostles watched he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight and behold two men stood by them in white apparel who are these men those are angels you're right and they said men of Galilee why do you stand here gazing up into the heavens this same Jesus that was taken from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven they said he's gonna come the same way that he left now think about how Jesus left when Jesus ascended up to heaven the Bible says the disciples looked at him he was real he told them touch me feel me he ate in front of them on several occasions they saw him when he comes again he says I'll be the same way the angel said he's coming the same way he left he left in the clouds he's coming in the clouds he was visible when he left he's visible when he comes he was real when he left it was a personal experience it will be real and personal when he comes now, the reason I say that is some people say well Jesus already came it was a supernatural presence and not according to the Bible if you believe the Bible that'll be very clear that that's a misconception we need to understand this because Christ warned us very clearly when his disciples asked about his return there'd be a lot of confusion and deception 
Matthew 24, verse 5. We read a little of this last night. For many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and will deceive many. Many false prophets, many false Christs. And this is what Jesus said next. For there will arise false Christs and false prophets and show great signs and wonders. And you know, these false prophets often mingle in the Bible with their deception. Jesus said very clearly, Matthew 24, verse 26, Wherefore, if they say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in secret chambers, believe it not. Now, there are some very shrewd silver-tongued devils out there that claim to come in the name of the Lord and deceive people and exploit people and take advantage of them. But I'm especially worried about when the devil himself puts on his ultimate masquerade. Now, one way that you can know how to discern between the real Jesus when he comes and the counterfeit is how he comes. In the Christian church, there are two principal conflicting views regarding how Jesus is going to come. And I want to go on record right now and say, I'm glad that we got people here from all different backgrounds. Indeed, there are probably some who are agnostic or even atheists here. And you're just coming because you're curious. And I'm glad you're here. I used to be that way. It doesn't matter what your denomination or religion is. I'm thankful that you're here. And I should hasten to add, I think that God has his people in many different Christian persuasions. Did you hear me? I'm not of the belief that only people that happen to be of my particular church are going to heaven. Do you hear that? When it comes to the second coming, the two principal views are this. All Christians, or virtually all Christians, agree just before the end there is going to be something called the tribulation, a great time of trouble. Some people are wondering, are we on the verge of that now? Because there's a lot of harbingers that seem to indicate that there's going to be a meltdown of some sort before too long. Where the churches disagree is, will Christ come and rapture the saints up before the tribulation or after the time of trouble? Uh, now, and there's good Christians in both groups. You all hear me? I want you to go by what the Bible says. Does that sound fair? First of all, how many of you have heard of the seven years of tribulation? Okay. Name one scripture that talks about the seven years of tribulation. I'm going out on a limb here. We got cameras rolling and there's over a thousand people here and I'm saying, name a scripture. The reason you're hesitating is because there isn't any. Where does this idea come from of the seven years of tribulation? Well, some people draw it out of Daniel chapter 9. They take the last week off the 490-year prophecy and they stick it down at the end of time and they say, maybe that's it. Or they take the seven days that Noah was in the ark before the flood came and they say, well, let's make those days a year. Maybe that's it. But there's really the phrase seven years of tribulation is not in the Bible. And the idea of the secret rapture basically says people get a second chance. That's exactly what the devil wants people to believe. If you're not ready when the church is raptured, don't worry. You might have to go through the time of trouble, but you get another chance. No, Jesus says you got to be ready now. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. The reformers taught that the tribulation or the rapture takes place after the tribulation and that it is necessary to understand all the books of the um, Revelation because they're telling what's going on right up to the end of time. You've heard it said, well, Jesus is coming as a thief. Have you heard that before? And so it's going to be a secret. Church is just going to disappear. Let's read that whole verse. Sometimes people read part of a verse and they don't read on. As we read this verse where it says Jesus comes as a thief, you tell me if you think life goes on on earth for seven more years after the rapture. Here it is, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. Sound secret? The elements melt with fervent heat, and the earth and the works that are in it shall be burned up. Now, does that sound like anyone's going to have to tap you on the shoulder and say, did you catch that? Jesus came yesterday. <laughs> the whole elements are melting. Great noise. Nothing secret about it. Again, Matthew 24, verse 42. Know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. So when a thief comes, does he usually send an advance notice? 
I hesitate telling people this, but I used to be a thief. I was. I mean, I broke into people's houses at night and stole things. I stole cars. I stole TVs. I was a thief. I'm embarrassed to admit that to you. Praise the Lord. That was a different person back then. But, you know, I never sent a, an announcement said, by the way, I'm coming to ransack your house on such and such a day. So when it says a thief came, it simply means it was a surprise. But after I came, they knew. See what I'm saying? Let's go on here. It says, he would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken up. Again, Psalm 50 verse 3, our God will come and will not keep silence. It will be very tempestuous round about him. Does that sound like a secret? One more, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God. It's talking about the voice of a trumpet, a shout. Again, the Lord will roar from on high. He will utter his voice from his holy habitation. He'll mightily roar upon his habitation. He'll give a shout. All these scriptures are dealing with the second coming of the Lord. Will the second coming of Christ be visible to all men? What does the Bible say? Revelation 1 verse 7. Behold, he's coming with the clouds. And how many? Every eye will see him. Someone said, what about those that are in their graves? Well, it's understood. Every eye of everybody alive. Someone else said, well, Pastor Doug, if the world's around, how does every eye see him? It doesn't say every eye sees him simultaneously. As he comes and he goes around the circle of the earth, people are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Who will come with Jesus at the second coming and why? You can read about this in Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him he'll sit on the throne of his glory and again it tells us in verse 31 his angels will gather together his elect from the four winds of heaven so when he comes he's coming with all the angels that's the clouds he's coming in clouds of angels and they're gonna gather together those that are ready for his return from all four corners of the heaven means north south east west it means a, it's a universal gathering and again 2 Thessalonians 1 when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God so at the same time the, re the redeemed those who are prepared are caught up to meet the Lord in glory those same angels are going to be angels of judgment taking vengeance on those who have rejected God and lived selfish sinful lives this is what the Bible teaches friends and I am responsible to tell you the truth I want you to be my friend but even if you're not my friend I'm going to tell you the truth when Christ's resurrection took place, it says one angel rolled away the stone. The glory of that one angel was so awesome that the Roman soldiers were terrified and they fell down as though they were dead and then crawled away in terror. How many angels are there? How many of you have heard about guardian angels? You know, the Bible actually teaches that. Jesus implies that there are angels that watch over people and protect them. How many people in the world, I told you last night, just about 7 billion now 6.9 billion and maybe there's even one recording angel so one's watching and protecting one's doing video see what you're up to because everything you do Jesus said every idle word you speak you'll give an account thereof those things done in secret if your sins are not under the blood of the lamb it's all going to be in the judgment what is the purpose of Jesus coming why is he coming we told you in John 14 said if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am you might be also he wants you with him that's why he brought you to these meetings friends because he wants you there in the kingdom he's paid with his life to provide an opportunity for you to live forever because he loves you he wants you to be there but he won't force you we've got two options we're free if you choose to reject God and say I don't want to be part of Christ's kingdom or I don't want him in my life he gives you that freedom but if you want to be living forever in his kingdom then we need to accept him now again Revelation 22 last chapter of the Bible behold I come quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his works so he's coming to distribute rewards some will be caught up with glorified body, bodies and others will be judged and we'll talk about that more another time what will happen to the righteous people when Jesus comes the second time it says the Lord himself first Thessalonians 4 16 will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God 
and then it goes on to say the dead in Christ will rise first so those who are alive are caught up to meet the Lord and they're given glorified new bodies those that are in their graves that have died in faith of God the saved they're resurrected and so when the Lord comes the whole earth is convulsing there's great noise there's a resurrection again it doesn't sound like a secret it says the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed those who are alive are changed at that time for this corruptible must put on incorruption that means these bodies that get old and die and this mortal will put on immortality then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with the resurrected in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air that's what's often called the rapture it means to be caught up and so I do believe we will be caught up but it's not a secret you see the difference and we don't hang around there's not life going on for seven more years here on earth after we are caught up there's destruction and devastation on the planet after the Lord comes what happens to the wicked people when Jesus comes again I know this isn't pleasant but this is what the Bible teaches it says there in, first, in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8 Paul said then shall that wicked one be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming and so the wicked are destroyed by the brilliance of his coming you know you get a light and moths are attracted to the light you walk into a room where there's cockroaches you turn on the light and they run so everybody's gonna be either a moth or a cockroach when Jesus comes <laughs> and so that's the choice is up to you now this is a long verse stay with me Revelation chapter 6 verse 15 and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men it's talking about the worldly leaders and every bondman and every free man they hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and they said to the mountains and the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne for the wrath from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who will be able to stand I told you a moment ago the ones who are able to stand are the ones who have a relationship with the Lord they don't need to be afraid so how will Christ's second coming affect the earth itself what's happening globally to the planet when Jesus comes Revelation 16 and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great uh, it's not talking about like the 9.0 magnitude they had there in the South Pacific that shook Indonesia or even the one that just shook America Samoa they're talking about you know a 15 on the Richter scale globally all the tectonic plates in the world are gonna just start to juggle and jiggle and islands are swallowed up according to the Bible how near is the Lord's second coming Luke 21 verse 28 he said now when these things begin to happen look up and lift your heads because your redemption draws nigh now when it says lift your heads it doesn't mean go around on your knees lifting you get a crick in your neck doing that it's talking about having an attitude where your attention is on eternity and not on what you know is temporary does everyone here know that life is terminal do you all know that I, did I, I hope I didn't disturb you with that truth but we're not gonna be here forever the purpose for this life is to determine your eternity and that's why it's so important that we seek first the kingdom of God how can I be certain that I'll not be deceived by Satan regarding the second coming well it tells us as lightning shines from the east even to the west so will the coming of the Son of Man be the brightest light that they knew back then was lightning filling the heavens can you imagine one little bolt of lightning how bright that is what if the whole sky was as bright as an arc welder full of lightning would anyone have to elbow you and say did you see that everybody's gonna know when Jesus comes the brightest light that is known to man was that lightning again according to the word to the law and the testimony if they speak not according to this word it's because there is no light in them we've got to say what does the word of God say and again in Matthew 24 verse 26 wherefore as they say unto you behold he's in the desert go not forth if all of a sudden somebody asked a question last night why doesn't God appear on TV it's too small and that would be a medium that the devil uses you can hypnotize a person with television using their optic and their auditory nerves I think people do it all the time do you know anyone hypnotized by TV 
Yeah, I, for some people get addicted. The idea, I tell you, if Satan was going to impersonate Christ, that's probably the very medium he'd use. So if anyone suddenly appears anywhere in the world and says, yeah, he's, I just heard that he's over now in the desert, go not forth. Don't even look because you are opening yourself up to deception then. Because you know when Jesus comes, do his feet even touch the ground? No, he were come, caught up to meet him in the air. So the coming of the Lord, according to what we've read, it is literal, it is personal, it is visible, it's audible, trumpets like a roar, the ground is shaking, it's physical, it's vitalizing, it's glorious, it's climatic, there's a resurrection. So here's a question. Does that sound like a secret to you? Do you think that all of a sudden you're going to wake up one morning and you're going to yawn and look and all of a sudden your spouse is gone from the bed next to you and, and their pajamas are laying there? I mean, this is really, this is what people believe, but I tell you, friends, Christians did not believe that 150 years ago. That is a new doctrine that has become very popular. It's very fanciful. It's very colorful, and it's not biblical. If you go by what Christians and the Bible and the reformers, I mean, what I'm telling you is what Spurgeon believed. It's what Billy Graham used to believe. It's what uh, Luther believed. It's what uh, Wesley believed. Calvin Zwingli, all the great reformers, they believed in the literal coming of the Lord, cataclysmic coming of the Lord after the tribulation. I just want you to be ready. And by the way, what I'm teaching you is safer. See, because if you believe the popular misconception that if you miss the secret rapture, you get seven more years, you've got to go through the tribulation, but maybe you'll be converted during that time, uh, it can give you a false sense of security. If, if I'm wrong and you're ready right now, I'll apologize when we get to heaven. You understand what I'm saying? My theory is not only biblical, it's safer. Be ready now because when he comes again, that's it. There's no second chance for seven years, friends. Amen? Of what great danger does God solemnly warn us as we enter the last days? He says, therefore, be ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. He wants us to start living in a state of readiness. You don't want to be doing it like you're waiting for the date, the last minute to file your tax returns. I don't know, you guys have tax returns here? Yeah, they're everywhere. That's universal, isn't it? Some people wait until the last day to file. Don't do that with your soul, friends. You don't know if you've got tomorrow, do you? I'm not trying to scare you, but you know that's a fact. You want to be ready now. The Bible says, therefore, since all these things can be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we be in all holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, in which the heavens being on fire will be dissolved and the elements will melt with fervent heat, knowing that all this is going to pass away. Why would you store your treasure down here? My appeal is for you to store your treasure in heaven, friends. Jesus said, behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. We're running out of time. There's only two kinds of people when Jesus comes. One group that's going to run from him and one group that's going to run to him and they'll declare, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. It says, we'll be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And everybody here is going to be in one of those two groups. My appeal is for you to say, Lord, I want to be ready. I want to be in that group that's prepared. I want to know you when you come. Once again, friends, we're very thankful that you are here for the Reclaim Your Faith program. And I hope those of you who are here, part of the live audience, will be praying in your hearts. As I said, I realize that in some respect, I might be talking here to the choir. But we know statistically there are a lot of people that are going to church that are just hanging by their fingernails. And we want to encourage you who are in the church to hold on to that plow and not look back. And then there are some of you that have maybe drifted away. We're thankful that you're here. We're thankful that you're watching. And the Lord is calling you. You know, one of the stories in the Bible that always amazed me is the story of Jonah. How a prophet of God, I mean, you've got to be a church member to be a prophet of God, could think you could run from God. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, 
that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah was running from the Father. God said for him to go east, and he went west. How can you run from the presence of God? Where can I flee from your spirit? There might be some of you here or watching, and you think that uh, God doesn't see you. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro through the whole earth. God sees us wherever we go. Jesus said, I'm with you wherever you go. You can't hide from God. And I hope you realize that the Lord, he chases after the ones he loves. And he will make you restless until you find your rest in him. You will never be happy until you surrender to the Lord and to his will. Because you are designed for a relationship with God. And so especially those maybe who have grown up in the church and never really had a personal relationship. They're still looking for that meaning, and so they try to find it out in the world. And they run from their father's house. You know, we've been looking at some stories in Luke chapter 15. We talked last night about the uh, lost sheep. And you know, there's the story that you find here about, in verse 8, what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me. I found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, the coin didn't know it was lost. A woman in Bible symbology, you know what it represents? Typically a church. Sometimes in our churches, we've got a precious lost coin, and we must make an effort to light the lamp of God's word and to sweep with that diligence and look through the community and find those precious coins. They may not even know that they're lost. They used to be in the woman's house, but they've been misplaced somehow. I wonder how many churches have some precious silver that's been misplaced. And then we go to another, the sheep, he wanders, he doesn't know what's going on, he just gets lost, the coin certainly doesn't know, but when you get to the last story, it's not an accident, it's deliberate desertion, the prodigal son. Luke 15, verse 11, and then Jesus goes on, and he says, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them says to his father, father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, and he journeyed to a far country. And there he wasted his possessions with prodigal or wild, wasteful living. You know, uh, I used to think what this meant was that the boy said to his father, you know, I've been waiting for you to die so I can get my inheritance. But you're taking too long, and your health looks really good. So can you just, you know, pay up now? But it wasn't uncommon in Bible times for the younger son, maybe especially if he was engaged, to get his inheritance to start his family, or at least part of it. But uh, the boy evidently didn't have any marital prospects, and he didn't want to live under the father's thumb. He evidently didn't get along very well with his brother. And he said, look, I just want to get out from under dad's rules and regulations. There was some tension. Dad's too strict and old-fashioned. You ever heard that? Now, sometimes when uh, we run away from home, there is a period of enjoyment and pleasure. You'll have at least the illusion of freedom for a while. The Bible talks about the pleasures of sin for a season, and he did have a little bit of a party with his friends. And as long as he was willing to buy the drinks, he had friends. The Bible tells us that uh, when you've got money, you'll at least seem like you've got friends for a while. But then it was all gone. He went to swipe his card, and the cashier said, sorry, there's nothing left. He said, I don't understand. I still have checks in my book. I should still have money. And then they're simultaneous with running out of money. There came a famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Now, while that boy is in the far country, what is the father doing? His heart is yearning after his son in this far country. 
He is praying for his son. I wonder how he's praying. How do you pray for your kids? Lord, keep them safe. Keep them well. Watch over them. Bless them. Sometimes you might say, Lord, bring into their lives whatever they need to be safe for eternity. And so maybe that dad was praying and a famine came to that country. And he had nothing to eat. Maybe one of his former bar buddies is the one who had the pig farm. And it says in verse 15, he went and he joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into the fields to feed swine. Now keep in mind, you've got Jesus, Jesus, a Jewish rabbi. He's talking to Jewish listeners about this Jewish boy that goes into a far country. And he ends up tending someone else's pork chops. That was as low as you could get. In the Bible, if you wanted to talk about reaching the bottom, well, Jesus said, you don't give that which is holy to the dogs and don't cast your pearls before swine. You know, it's amazing that um, you stay away from the Father's house very long, you can forget everything you learned and end up in the dumpster. How do you think our Heavenly Father feels? when after he has paid so much that you might live in a mansion someday, that we go to the garbage of the devil's dumpster for happiness. It breaks his heart. So he was out there feeding the pigs, and he was so hungry that he wanted to eat the husks that the pigs were rejecting. You've got to be pretty hungry at a time like that. And even though he was becoming emaciated, it says no one gave him anything. The world cannot satisfy what you really need. The world will not be able to satisfy that real hunger. That hunger for the bread of life is only going to come from the Father's house. And there are people out there that are going from one thing to the next. Or they're getting deeper and deeper in addictions. And they keep having to up their prescription because they're looking for some kind of peace and satisfaction. You're never going to be satisfied in this life without Jesus. And you're going to find him in church. In spite of the people that may be there with the problems, in spite of all the flaws and the wrinkles and the difficulties, the church is the object on earth upon which God bestows his supreme regard. It is the apple of his eye. It is the people for whom he died. And he wants you in that group. It is the crucible where we learn to be like Christ. So, while he was out there with the pigs, started to think about when they used to get the fresh bread out of the oven at home and all of the things he had taken for granted in his father's house. He came to himself. It's like he woke up one day and said, what in the world am I doing? He had an epiphany. He said, here, my father's got servants. He's got silos full of food. There is bread in my father's house. What am I doing here? And he came to his senses. That's kind of like sin will make you crazy. It's really. It's like Nebuchadnezzar. He was so full of pride, next thing he knew, he was out of his mind. And it took seven years for him to wake up and come to himself. And the first thing that came out of his mouth when he came to himself was, I praise the God in heaven. Because unless God is your priority, you're not thinking straight. Really. I mean, it's like Moses before the children of Israel entered the promised land. His closing sermon. He said, let me make it plain. No, I put that in, but this is essentially what he said. He said, I'm setting before you this day life and good and blessing, or death and evil and cursing. Which one do you want? Now, when you put it that way, what would you say you want? Do you want the life and good and blessing of being a Christian and in the church? In spite of the problems, it's a lot better than being out here where there's the death and the evil and the cursing. And that's why Jesus is wanting to bless you. He begins his sermon with beatitudes because he wants to bless his people. There's no happiness outside of the Father's house. And no one gave him anything. Finally, he came to his senses, and he said, you know, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? They've got extra. They eat to the full. You know, whenever Jesus fed people, it says they had leftovers. He'd multiply the bread, and there were leftovers. Elisha blessed the vessel of oil, 
there in 2 Kings chapter 4, and the woman poured it, and it just was overflowing. God blesses with an abundance. And here he was wanting to eat the husks, the seed pods that the pigs were snorting through. They've got food to spare. Jesus is wanting to give you that bread of life. And I perish with hunger. You know, Jesus came into the world very simply, John 3, 16. He came into the world that you might not perish. And if you're not eating the bread of life, at least every week, you should be every day, you will surely perish. You're going to be starving. You know, in the last days, the Bible foretells there's going to be a famine in the land, and it's not a famine for bread or a thirst for water. This is Amos chapter 8, but for hearing the word of God. And I think you might even find a famine sometimes among religious people because there's so many counterfeit versions of the word of God. And people will read one little verse and then they'll talk about the latest magazine articles. People need to really get into the, the grist of God's word. There's an abundance of truth in the Father's house. And I perish with hunger. You know, it's interesting. When they woke up Jonah, when he was running from God. Oh, by the way, going back to Jonah, my mind bounces around like that. It's because I use drugs when I'm young, so you just have to deal with it. <laughs> going back to Jonah, you know, when he was asleep in the boat on the way to destruction... God sent a storm to save him. And the Lord sent a famine to save that boy. And maybe some of you who have been out of the church, you've been going through some trials and wondering, why is this happening? It could be because God loves you, and he's trying to get your attention. Sometimes it takes a crisis. It might be a crisis in your marriage. It could be a crisis with your health or work. And God is saying, hello, hello. Can I have your attention, please? And when the captain woke up Jonah, you know what he said? Arise, O sleeper, carest not that we perish. Jesus was once asleep in a boat during a storm, and they woke him up, and they asked Jesus the dumbest question in the world. They said, Master, carest not that we perish? Does Jesus care whether or not we perish? Why did he come into this world? that we might not perish. And if you got Jesus in your boat, you're going to make it, friends. So not perish with hunger. I will arise. God told Jonah, arise and go. Finally, he said, I will arise and go to my father. And I'll say to him, father, he's got a speech prepared. How can I walk back and talk to dad? After what I've done here, I basically was so rude, disrespectful, didn't honor him, asked for my inheritance early. Then I took it. I'm coming back with nothing to show for it. He worked for years to get all that. You notice the boy earlier, he wanted his father, but he didn't want a relationship with his father. I'm sorry, he wanted his father's blessings. He wanted his father's resources, but he didn't want the father. Now, I think everybody here wants God's blessings. There are whole churches that are built around the reason that God exists is just to be a funnel of blessings for you. Really, we exist for the glory of God. And the secret of life is not ultimately your happiness, it's your holiness. But your holiness will lead to happiness. And by the way, Jesus said it's more blessed to give than receive. And the most important way for you to be blessed is to give your heart, then you receive the greatest blessing. That's the only way you can ever be happy, is by giving your life to Jesus. I'm going to arise and go to my father's house. He's thinking about how do I ever face him again after what I've done. I'll go, and here's what I'll say. I have to confess. Father, I have sinned. By the way, you must confess when you come to God. Don't be afraid. Does he know anyway? Well, you'll feel better if you confess. He already knows. You're not going to shock him. <laughs> One of the first things you do is you repent. Tell God you're sorry and you confess your sins. And as soon as you do that, you give him permission to release the power of his spirit in your life. And I'll say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Who's worthy to be a son of God? That's why John tells us in... 1 John chapter 3, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. He can't even explain it. He says, just behold it. 
that we should be called sons of God. He's willing to give us a new name and bring us back into the family with the full stature of being sons. I'm not worthy. What is it that makes us worthy? It's only God's grace and his son, Jesus Christ. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now, that is the attitude that we all need when we come back to the Father. Lord, I'm willing to come and serve you. I don't deserve to be your son. I'll be happy as your servant. And so he begins his journey home. He arose and he came to his father. And it took a long way for him to plod. Probably didn't have any spare food in his backpack. Had to beg along the way. But he was shocked as he started getting near the family farm. While he was still a great way off, coming over the hill, and the silhouette of his form is seen there hobbling along. As soon as the father spies him, he runs to meet him. He doesn't make him wait. You know, some of us, I think, we'd say, well, I told you you'd become dragging back. <laughs> Arms folded on the front porch, tapping our foot, looking the other way. <laughs> say, all right. Was I right or was I right? <laughs> That's what I'd probably do. <laughs> we, we've got that speech, I told you so. <laughs> or we'd make that, uh, make that statement in front of the spouse. And say, Didn't I tell you that he'd... <laughs> But not this father. He can't even wait for him to come home. So that he won't be left with any doubt of his acceptance. He arises and he runs to meet him. You know, there's a promise in the Bible. It says, you draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Our father in heaven is so anxious for us to be saved. That means that as soon as we take some steps and we begin to move towards God. And he sees us making an effort to come to him. What does he do? He will run to meet us. Now, how come that father didn't send out bounty hunters to find the son when he first went away from home? Can you force someone to love you? And you know, our father in heaven can't force you to come home. He's not going to force you to come back to church. You've got to come to your senses and take those first steps and say, you know, I believe this is where I'm supposed to be. There's bread in my father's house. And as you come, as soon as you make that first step, you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. You know, there are a number of scriptures that uh, are on that, uh, that line. First you come, and you come confessing. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14. Only acknowledge your iniquity, that you've transgressed against the Lord your God, that you've not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. He's pleading with Israel here. He says, return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. You know, not only here in Jeremiah, but in the book of Hosea, God not only compares it to a father and a son, but it's, he compares it to a husband and a wife. And he says, you know, even though you've been unfaithful, even though you've gone after other gods, I love you so much that I'll still take you back. That takes a lot of love because I'll tell you, you know, one of the most difficult uh, things to deal with is when there's been infidelity in a marriage. Some people fold their arms and stomp their foot and say, that's the end. But God's love is so incredible that he says to his people, even after you have spurned my love with someone else, return to me. He says to his people, return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I'm married to you. And again in verse 22, return you backsliding children and I will heal your backsliding. How anxious is God to be reunited with you? You think that God's mad at you? Sin will destroy you. It's not because God doesn't love you. It's the nature of sin. God doesn't need to be mad at you. Sin is, it just self-destructs. And that's why time is of the essence. The longer that we wait to come back to the Father's house, we're living a very risky life that we're going to starve or end up like the pigs that we live with. You know, you can come to your senses and wake up and have an epiphany and say, I need to arise and go to my father. When you realize that, you need to act on it. It is dangerous for you to think that you can play with the gift of repentance and that it will come later at your call. 
God, God tells us in Acts chapter 2, repentance is even a gift. And so the impression that you've got that you need to come back to church, you need to act on that when you get it. Because that's a gift of God. God is calling you. And the longer that we say no to the Father who's speaking to us and through his spirit wooing us, the volume can get lower and lower. It can be drowned out by all the other background noise so that you can get to the place where you don't hear it anymore. And so if you hear the Father calling you, if you know that it's time for you to come back, don't wait for a better opportunity. Now is the time. You know, I told you this story is about rejoicing. This whole chapter, rejoicing when that lost sheep is found. Rejoicing when the missing coin is recovered. Rejoicing in heaven when the prodigal, who's been maybe out of the church in the father's house for years, comes home. And uh, there's likewise rejoicing with God when we come back to him. He is infinitely more willing to receive us than sometimes we are to come. He's paid so much that we might be forgiven, that we might have everlasting life. Why do we want to go to that far country and dig in the devil's dumpster? It's never going to satisfy you. The only thing that's going to bring satisfaction is Jesus.